All right, I am going to get started. Feel free if you guys are going back and forth um, to the bathroom. It's no problem. Most of this is probably pretty basic and boring. Um, before I get started, though, there's one thing. So if you guys are going on the tour today, they did say it is, as you can imagine, a little bit muddy out there. So if people have a change of shoes and have some that aren't real nice, that would be a good idea. Um, otherwise, we'll figure it out when we get out there. But um, And then the second part of the tour is at Laughing Sun Brewery, so we shouldn't get muddy over there anyway. But, um, oh, and one other thing. If anybody reached out to me to get those uh, rural living handbooks, I sent an email out a while back. I brought them all, and they are up here to the right. Um, and then you can just take the elevator that's there out to the parking lot and take them, please. Um, I'll mention it again tomorrow, but I know there's a few people here that I got them for, so. All right, so I'll just get started. A lot of what Kelly and Lance said, I'm kind of repeating it. Basically, I'm just going to go through my procedure, at, you know, how I do a tree planting plan, kind of from start to finish. Um, some people do it a little differently. Um, I know some people like to use Google Earth. I use ArcGIS instead. Um, it's kind of whatever you get familiar with. I was fortunate enough I had somebody in my office to train me in. A lot of people don't have that option. So um, anyway, we'll just kind of go through how I do it. And like I said, if you don't agree with it, that's fine. Um, there's an episode of The Office that um, Michael says, explain it to me like I'm a five-year-old. And that's kind of probably what I'm going to be doing to some of you people. But I'm just assuming that if you're here, you're, you know, new to planting trees anyway. So step one, meeting the producer. I personally like to go out in the field. As Lance mentioned, you, you really can't beat a site visit. But in the middle of January, a site visit really isn't very helpful when you can't see anything. So. A lot of times the producer comes into the office and then you can, you know, pull up the imagery there and kind of, you know, you can see a lot of indicators from that. It's kind of hard to tell tree species from an aerial photo, but at least it's somewhere to start. Um, that's where a site visit's really handy is when you can go out and actually see what trees. Granted, in January it is kind of hard to tell what species they are, but most of the time you can get a pretty educated guess of what's out there. Um, some of the information, you know, the location of the site, whether it's at their residence or, you know, what the legal description is. Um, and this is basically just filling out this CPA4 form, which every tree planting plan should have one of these. Um, and kind of what they're looking to do um, with their planting, you know, what, what are their concerns? Um, gaining off-site information, so... Um, this was touched on um, quite a bit. So, you know, I use the GIS um, software for my maps, but I go to Web Soil Survey, and that's where I actually get my soils information um, as far as the CTSG um, groups. Oh, and then before I forget, there is an, there's an app that you can download um, on your phone. It's called the clever name, the Soil Map app. And that's pretty handy when you're out in the field if you don't have an actual, you know, if you don't have anything to look at like GIS or Web Soil Survey, you can pull that up and that's, pre that's pretty nice. At least it gets you, um, gets you started per where your location is and what soils you're in. Um, so here's just a GIS image in Grand Forks County. So you obviously can click the on the left hand side there, click the ours says Grand Fork Soils on it, and you click that, and then it gives you your green lines there that show you your um, soil um, your soil types there. And so the sheet on the right, everybody's probably familiar with. Um, it, if not before today, you've seen it a couple times today. Um, we actually went through and we made our own sheets here. Um, so what I, I mean, basically just went down the columns and whatever species was there, we put it on the list here. It's a little easier for us when we're meeting with producers. It's a one page document and it's all listed right there. So it's, it's easy to go through. Um, 
we used to have producers sign this to say, hey, you know, we, we know what the recommended species are. Now I'll show you, I've got in a few slides, we've got a different document, our tree planting agreement that we use instead. Um, but a lot of times I do leave this document with the producer, so it, maybe when I leave their place, we haven't decided uh, on a tree species yet. They've got something to start with anyway. Um, and then I also, you know, we have, uh, I don't know if I have a slide with it, but we do have a, a list of all the species that we carry too, and I always leave that with them as well. In case, you know, maybe they either want to do a hand plant or they might just call and say, you know, this, how about we do this one instead? And then I can either shoot them down and say there's no possible way that that uh, red maple is going to work on a CTSG 10, or maybe it is something that we hadn't talked about and I completely forgot. And then make sure on the upper left hand co corner you're in the correct MLRA. Um, we are in, in the eastern part of the state, we're in 56, but the western part of our county actually does dip into the 50, 55A, I think, or 55B, whatever it is. Yeah, 55B. So there's just that map. You, I mean, most offices have a bunch of these. So when I go out on a site visit, I usually bring one of these uh, Garmin's. It's just, I don't know, it gets you a general, it's not the most accurate GPS in the world, but that's what we had in the office, and it, it works. It, I can just, you know, enter the points, and then when I get back to the office, I just look up those waypoints that I marked. And it's, it's good if I want to mark like, oh, here's a property marker here, or here's where I want this row to start, and we basically just drove out in a ranger, and he says, I want the row to start right here. Well, by the time I get back to the office, or sometimes it's even hard to look on an aerial image, you know, and see where's right here. But if I have a GPS point, I can be within 10 feet, at least, of where he's, where he's talking about starting. Um, and then I know Lance talked about this. Take, take note of other existing trees. That's, it's really important to know what's already out there. Because if you're in some marginal ground, but you do see some trees that are doing really well out there, you can make a case that, hey, you know, maybe this ground isn't, isn't as bad as it's mapped to be. Um, and then, you know, the other side of it is which ones are really struggling. You know, if they say, my dad planted these spruce trees <clears throat> back in 68 and they're waist high. It's, you know, they're alive, but it's probably not the best idea to go with spruce trees at that point. Um, grass and other vegetation, you know, really good indicators. Like Lance said, if you see a bunch of uh, foxtail or kochia and that's all you see, there's a pretty good chance there's not many trees other than a sea berry or a Russian olive that are, that are even going to survive the first year there. Um, and yeah, take GPS points. It doesn't matter what, I mean, of course you can do it on your phone too. It doesn't matter, but like I said, when you get back to the office and you're looking at aerial images trying to figure out where you were, and oh yeah, where was this at? Because you can't see it on the images like you could on the ground. It's good to have those GPS points. Oh, another one I didn't say. Standing water issues too. Especially when you're in, let's say, one of those development plantings that Lance talked about. If they've manipulated the land a little bit, old aerial imagery is probably not going to show where they have water image or water issues. But if you talk to the, the homeowner, they odds are they know where they've been dealing with water issues. So that's just enough, you know, anything, any information you can get from them the people that are there every day can be really helpful. Um, let's see. Oh, then of course, the, the basics. Uh, how many rows, well, A, how much space are you willing to give up? Sometimes that's a point of contention, you know. They want to do eight rows, but they only want to give up a 30-foot wide swath. Well, that's just not going to work. You know, it might have worked in the 40s, but it doesn't work now. So um, just go over spacings, you know, what kind of site prep you need to do with them. That's always a big thing, you know, that people forget that, you know, there, there is some site prep involved. If there's gopher mounds out there, you know, trying to plant trees on gopher mounds when the person on the planter's up here and then down here and then up here, it doesn't work real well. Um, then whether, you know, 
are we planting all the trees? Are there some hand plants you want to do to save yourself some money? Are you going to do fabric? Um, some fabric machines claim to be, you know, that you can no-till with a fabric machine. We've tried to no-till with a fabric machine and ended up swearing a lot and going, and it took way longer than it needed to. And it was just as simple as tilling the ground a couple times. So basically if we're going to do fabric, it, the ground's got to be worked. That's just the way it is. We don't want to waste the time flipping sod chunks over. I know people have said if you spray it and a year ahead of time, you know, that helps. But we, we just say, you know, if you're going to do fabric, it needs to be tilled. If you can't till it, it's a service that we offer. $75 an hour for us to come out and the clock doesn't start until the tiller's spinning. So it's pretty reasonable. Most people can hardly do that themselves. And if they go rent equipment, there's no way they can do it themselves for that price. Um, do they want tree tubes? What are the pros and cons on tree tubes? Tomorrow, um, Joe Zelesnik's going to talk in one of the breakout sessions about the pros and cons of tree tubes. And there's definitely cons with tree tubes if you've ever used them. Um, and if you aren't familiar, yeah, with what they are, even check out that talk tomorrow. Uh, documenting the information. So this is when I'm back in the office, putting in those GPS points. Um, using whatever measuring tool. There's a measuring tool on um, ArcGIS, but you know Google Earth has one, Google Maps has one. Um, then you figure out your spacing, but luckily your CPA4 form will help. You know, once you know what spacing you've got, that figures out how many trees and shrubs you're going to be planting. And I always overestimate the distance even though I'm fairly confident how far we're going, whether it's landmarks or whatever else, it doesn't hurt to bring a few extra trees out there. I mean, obviously you gotta order enough trees, so I always overestimate the distance a little bit. Then here, I mean, there's a drawing tool right in here with GIS, it's really nice, you know, between the measuring tool and the drawing tool, you can get, get pretty accurate. There's a measuring tool. You can change it to whether you want it to do area like acres or whether you want it just to do linear feet. Web soil survey, um, Lance touched on this quite a bit and I think Kelly did too, but that's a, it's a great place um, not only to find CTSGs, you can find your pH. There's a, there's a lot of things that you can do in there that I, I'm really not even familiar with. I'm, I'm learning with it all the time, but there is a ton of information that you can find just, just through web soil survey. All right, there's your CPA four, getting all your information in there. Um, the notes section is really important too. If it's July and you're meeting with somebody for a planting next year, or like this year with the Outdoor Heritage Fund grant, I was meeting with people in the end of February for a 2023 planting. It's important to take as many notes as you can. Obviously, this is a very small part. Um, I have a CPA or CP6, CPA6 form um, that I take a lot more notes than this on. But when you haven't looked at it in eight months, it's, it's nice to be able to familiarize yourself, um, especially when you're out in the field, too. If the more notes you have, the better. Or if they start arguing with you about what you talked about, more notes the better. I, I like to go email almost with all um, correspondence because it's always in writing then and then they can't say well why did we put this? It happens almost every year with somebody and be like because this is what you told me to do and then it's in an email. Here's that planting agreement I mentioned earlier. Um, it's pretty simple but basically it's just a way to cover ourselves if something happens, you know, or you warn them that, hey, you know, there is, there is some marginal ground in here. Overall, we think your trees are going to do well, but as we saw this last year, I mean, it got pretty dry and it's just a way to cover. Plus there's a portion in here that they're going to take care of the trees, you know, after you've planted them, they're going to pay a deposit by a certain date before you order the trees, um, sign and date it at the end. I pretty much have everybody fill this out um, and I haven't had any issues since doing this but I did have issues before doing this where people backed out without paying a deposit and then we had a few hundred trees that we had no home for. 
So what are the options when there are no options? This is kind of how Lance ended his um, talk, but CTSG-10, there are some where it looks like the surface of the moon, and there really aren't that many options. Do people still want to plant trees there? Yeah. Um, are there places that shouldn't have trees? Yeah. Um, there, you know, if they maybe want to, let's say, go and hand plant some trees themselves, you know, just to just to see, you know, 10 trees from us is 20 bucks. They go hand plant them, they all die, they're out 20 bucks, you know. For us to come out and do a planting, it's a $200 minimum, you know. So that, that hurts a little more than 20 bucks. Um, like Lance said, you know, if you have a soil scientist come out there and maybe you don't think that this soil is mapped the way it should be and you have a soil scientist come with you on a visit and they say that you're, you know, 2KK, which we deal with a lot, is all of a sudden a 3 or a 1. Well, then all of a sudden you have a lot more options out there. So there's, I mean, that's where a site visit comes in too. You, if you look out there and there isn't a shred of anything growing, except sometimes we have that little red salt weed that grows out there. I mean, it's kind of a waste of time, whether you, you know, and like Lance said too, if this is your professional opinion, and if you tell, you know, if you go along with the planting and it fails, you know, you don't look real good. That being said, I have planted a fair amount in tens where I was very skeptical anything would grow. They didn't grow. I had them sign that agreement. You know, they, they kind of knew they wouldn't grow, but they were, you know, hopeful. And so that's the way it was, but... Um, with cost share, there's there's no chance to ever do that. But um, I don't know. Looking back, you probably probably shouldn't have done that. But when people keep, just keep asking and asking, you know, if we just give it a shot, just give it a shot. You know, I went with it. But so that's that's it. Is there any questions? All right. Well, I think we'll take another quick break then, and we'll. What's next? Site design challenges. Oh yeah, we'll do that next. You want to do yours first, or since mine's pulled in, I can feel the sweat running down my back. I'll shut that recording off as I'm talking. <laughs>